continue our work as a working group. We are the Research Ethics Working Group, for those of you who uh, haven't uh, met us. And we decided to use this uh, working group uh, uh, spot uh, to invite two guest speakers. And uh, the first speaker uh, is Jay Marlow, an Associate Professor and an Associate uh, Dean, University of Auckland, New Zealand. And uh, he will talk about a uh, case study uh, and, uh, on the New Zealand Ethics Committee that uh, evaluates uh, research uh, ethics uh, uh, protocols or ethic, uh, research protocols. And the second uh, speaker will be Esa Gola. Uh, she is an alumni here and she come home here. And she is uh, right now uh, working as the chair of International Political Theory at Goethe University at Frankfurt, uh, uh, Germany. And she will talk about relational uh, egalitarianism and disaster. Uh, uh, the presentations are recorded, so we would like to, uh, uh, to tell you to use the microphone during the uh, discussion. Okay. Um, thank you uh, for the opportunity. Um, again, my name is Jay Marlin with the University of Auckland, and I teach in the social work uh, program. Um, what I'm wanting to do is I'm wanting to present a, uh, a case study of, a, of an ethics committee that I've been part of for the last four years that reviews um, ethics applications for those in community-based settings that wouldn't normally be eligible for ethics review. Really to ask the question, is this, is this a model that could be used for an international research ethics committee? And I want to sort of explore that by looking at some of the tensions between research ethics and research governance. Um, and so when we look at um, uh, community-based research, uh, you know, Mark Israel and others have written about how community-based research is oftentimes at the coal face, that uh, they often have a great sense of what they you know, the, the questions that matter and, and, um, and um, maybe some of the research questions that need to be addressed. Um, but the context in which community-based uh, organizations are, are positioned, and I'll, I'll come to the definition of how I'm, how I'm thinking about community in a minute, um, is situated where they are oftentimes on sort of this neoliberal agenda of, of increased reporting requirements, shorter term contracts, and that they're needing to show evidence for the number of dollars that are invested in terms of you know, getting a reasonable output for, what, for the level of investment. And they're also looking for impact, and that's not only in relation to the organizational survival, but also um, looking to improve practice, to inform policy, uh, to make impact in a number of ways. However, those within a community-based setting that that don't normally sit within uh, 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 tertiary institutions or within health-based health, health -based remit, usually double-blind clinical control trials, they aren't eligible for ethical review. So if they want to do research or evaluation, they just have to go about doing that without necessarily having some form of formal ethical oversight. So what that largely means is that if they want that level of, 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 uh, of engagement, they either have to co-opt a member that has access to those forms of research governance, or else they have to go alone. So Ron Ipovin uh, has written about some of this and has spoken about research governance and research ethics and uh, not wanting to, su to suggest that they're completely disparate terms, but he's lamented that traditional ethics-based committees, you know, IRBs, ERBs, uh, health disability ethics committees, have moved increasingly towards a research governance structure, sometimes at the expense of research ethics, and that research governance is more interested in protecting the institution than necessarily the research ethics itself. And so this, in some ways, relates to the politics of representation in that um, for community-based groups, I mean, if you wanted to submit an article, oftentimes you have to tick a box on that online thing, you know, I've, 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 I've gone through the necessary ethical protocols and that sort of thing for the editor even to send it out for peer review. Um, and so that, and um, as well for community-based organizations, even if they do the research, it's, often not, it's, it's oftentimes not seen as legitimate or or, or uh, valid, and so therefore their voice is, 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 is limited. So community-based research in these contexts is often silent. Um, so to, so to sort of, I guess, put a metaphor to this, research governance is often sort of like a gatekeeping function that, um, and I'm not necessarily critical of that, um, but basically you have to meet certain ethical principles and that through that, uh, uh, the institution decides that yes, this, this, is, this is ethical research, you can go ahead. Um, but this can be a this can be a conflict with with research ethics. Uh, an example of the of a research of a of my research ethics committee, I did a photo voice project with refugee background youth, and um, 
the, the, the committee wouldn't approve it, so I met with the chair and I discussed some of the, some of the issues. And I sort of said, look, we, we've addressed the ethical issues, but he still wouldn't let it go ahead. And so I said, actually, you're not gonna, this isn't an ethical conversation we're having. It's asking one about risk management and your perceived perceptions about refugees and risk. What she actually said, well, I was stunned by, I actually said, yes, you're right. So it wasn't research ethics that was holding it up. It was actually research governance. Um, but regardless, I, I, I did actually change the study and I was able to go ahead, which I think probably compromised the study on, on some levels. But once that gate's opened, it then creates a certain pathway. And this, this isn't news to any of you, I'm sure. But um, what a number of, of ethicists have, have, have since sort of lamented is that, you know, Van Honard is, has referred to this as sort of IRBs as moral panic. Um, Sorry, um, Pritchard has, has, has referred to the bureaucratization of ethics review as, as, as an ethics creep, and Pritchard has referred to the researcher as traveler and the IRB as trolls. Now, it's not necessarily my intention to present IRBs in that, in that light, but I think it does sort of highlight some of those tensions around research governance and research ethics, and that for those in community-based research, they can't even walk down this pathway in the first place. They, they just have to go about doing the research or evaluation um, with, without that kind of oversight. So when I talk about community-based research, I'm really sort of defining community quite broadly here, that this might relate to non-government organizations, faith-based organizations, um, community groups, um, consultants, even, even, even potentially uh, government departments that may not have access to ethics review. And so within New Zealand, those groups have two strikes against them, that unless they co-opt an institutional member, usually a tertiary uh, institution, or else within a very narrowly defined biomedical realm of medical research, they can't have ethics review. This isn't exclusive to, um, to New Zealand. Uh, this is certainly the case in, in uh, the States, um, Canada. Um, I'm, I'm aware in a number of European contexts as well, which really creates a community-based research ethics vacuum. Um, and so to respond to that, what I've been involved with for the last four years has called, been called the New Zealand Ethics Committee, where we um, review community-based research applications, so those people who aren't normally eligible for ethics review for free. We're, we're funded through charitable organizations. Um, and, and basically, um, uh, and we're able to move quite quickly, it's, it's a group of academics, professionals, and lay members across New Zealand. We, we communicate by... Um, on online through Skype and email, and also with the applicant. And we review more or less social science research applications. Um, we have reviewed applications related to disasters, most particularly in relation to the Canterbury earthquakes, which is kind of one of the reasons why I'm here. I'm wanting to hear your thoughts around how this might work if it was to be internationalized. Um, and that really we have a different philosophy, that submission to us is entirely voluntary. You can, you can come to us or not, up to you. You can apply to us. If we don't approve your research, you can still conduct your research. There's nothing to stop you. So basically, and because we're not behind an institution, there's, there's not an institution that we're trying to protect. So, we're, so our focus is actually explicitly on research ethics. So, and really in 2013, we reviewed 14 applications. And um, 2014, that went up to 20. Last year, it was 50. And this year, we'll, we'll certainly eclipse that. So there is certainly clearly a, a thirst for, for research within these community-based settings, which I would argue sort of shifts that paradigm from that of sort of gatekeeping to one of sort of bridge building. And it's not trying to suggest that it's anything goes and that we approve any research. There have been applications that we've declined, and there are ones that we've even said it's not appropriate for us to review. Um, but that, you know, if, if, if there is mutual agreement to, to proceed, then it is an opportunity to possibly try to build, build a bridge as opposed to focusing on a gatekeeping function that sort of, that focuses on the institution itself. So we're relatively in a, a powerless uh, group. And so there are two, there are two questions that, uh, that, that, that arise from that. And one is, is, is a study that, that I published with a colleague that, um, that I'll speak to just very briefly. And then secondly, I want to think about what this might mean for an international disaster ethics committee and to hear from you. Um, so really, you know, um, does this NZEX or New Zealand <coughs> Ethics Committee model actually present sort of a, a different paradigm and does that paradigm shift represent something that might actually be useful? Um, and secondly, um, 
What might be the associate, associated possibilities for such a committee, an International Disaster Research Ethics Committee? What might be some of the complexities, implications, and possibilities? So I just want to very quickly just re um, report on, a, on an evaluation that we conducted of the 14 applicants that participated in uh, 2013. And basically we asked them the question, you know, we're effectively powerless. We can't force you to come to us. We can't stop you from doing research. Why did you come to us in the first place? What are the contexts that you actually came to us? And then, um, and, um, you know, what are the strengths and the weaknesses of that? And so I just want to sort of present sort of three key themes that emerged for that, and then I'll move to thinking about an International Disaster Ethics Committee, and that's really where I'd like to hear from you. Um, but the first was that you know, when we spoke to these participants, it was, it was very clear, it was the most common uh, statement that they made was that there was this need for legitimacy and rigor. A lot of them used the word that they felt that their research needed to be valid, and that, unless they said they had ethics approval, they felt that when they tried to have conversations with the people that made decisions around things that count around funding or policy directives, that um, oftentimes their voice wasn't heard. What you did wasn't rigorous, it's not believable research, um, so on and so forth. And so, you know, a lot of them sort of spoke about the, that they wanted to make sure that the process was right. This is about validity. It was about being able to have a voice with the stakeholders, the, you know, um, with people that make decisions that count. Another thing that they actually said was that, is that a lot of them sort of spoke about a lack of fit of with traditional ethics committees. Now, I think it's important to recognize that, that organi community based organizations that had partnered with the universities and that, that had been a good story probably wouldn't have come to us because they've got good working relationships. Um, but a lot of our participants actually said that, you know, that they had to hand over control of the research to the institutions, that these university institutions sort of became these ivory towers that, that come sort of colonized or academic imperialism, which is my term, not theirs. But they sort of spoke about this, that, you know, that they lost control and that even the, the direction of the study design changed and that sort of thing in ways that they thought wasn't even necessary all that useful. And then finally, I guess for those of you that, that, that are academics, you, you may have experienced this um, uh, strife where an ethics committee sometimes confuses an ethical issue with a methodological one and you're suddenly finding you have to respond to uh, a methodological uh, advice which you don't necessarily see the ethical issue within. Um, and obviously there's a, sometimes there's a gray area in between those. But um, what was really interesting for our applicants was they actually spoke about the, actually, the actual desire for that and that they actually wanted that methodological input, recognizing that they may not have the research background that maybe others might have. Um, and so, you know, again, thinking about these, these, these ethics review paradigms, is it possible that a, a bridge building one is quite a different approach than one that is about sort of gatekeeping? And what are the implications and the resourcing and the sustainability of that, that, that that's associated with it? So really, I mean, what, what it sort of suggested was that, that, that this ethics committee really provided opportunities for capacity building that, and I think that it's, it's, it's addressed an unnecessarily narrow approach to research. Um, just a few weeks ago, the Royal Society is now going to host the New Zealand Ethics Committee on its website, so it's, it's, it's received national recognition now. Uh, we've actually received some, some requests for some international applications. So um, it's certainly a group that's growing. Um, um, and I think it provides a voice for those at that, at that coal face. Um, and that we've been quite clear that, that, it's, that this ethics committee isn't one that initially competes with traditional ethics review, but maybe sort of broadens the scope of what's possible within ethics review. So it could be possible win-wins and that the academy could support this and that really if, if most of, the, most of our, the members are actually academic members with within universities, about the universities recognizing the importance of community-based research and supporting that. So, but also I had some cautionary signals and considerations, and this is where I really want to hear from you, if possible, that, you know, if we think about this in terms of an international disaster ethics committee, um, you know, do you think about sort of particip participating or even anticipating events um, that might relate to natural hazards, man-made uh, catastrophes, I saw on the news this morning that 2.2 billion people are expected to be affected by Zika, um, terrorism, so on and so forth. So what is the scope? Would such a committee try to incorporate all of that? Would it have a very specific remit and try to grow from that? You then have a very diverse range of applicants from NGOs, faith-based organizations, community groups, a number of government bodies that don't have ethics oversight, consultants. 
Um, and the, with them, they'll, they'll have different research-based experiences, competencies, but also different roles. And that um, uh, a, a number of, of people have written about the, the problems that can arise when groups that are involved in uh, public health delivery, forms of care, get involved in research, and that sometimes the research then uh, is, 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 is complex with the delivery of, of service provision? And how is it that an international committee might be able to, to consider those things in local contexts? Um, that um, there are different codes of ethics, and you would know these probably as well as I would, or, or, or likely even better, but you know, around sort of the Tri-Council policy statement, CIOMS, the um, uh, Working Group on Disaster Research and Ethics, so on and so forth. And, you know, which, which of those or all those could, could inform how that committee would, would be structured? Um, and how would it engage with competing eth ethical principles, particularly as they intersect with different ethnocultural perspectives, different socio-political views, um, where you have different sort of meanings ascribed through a number of intersectional points around culture, ethnicity, so on and so forth. Um, you have a number of legal issues that within New Zealand, we've developed an indemnity statement that basically applicants sign that they, sign that they, they, they indemnify the New Zealand Ethics Committee um, in relation to the, to the research. But I'm not so sure, would that, would that apply in an international context? I don't know. And what might be the risks of that? Um, and then just finally looking at some of the international standards and procedures and how all of this might work. And so, um, Clearly, you know, this becomes a, a, a real balancing act, and what I think that, um, uh, I mean, my, my colleagues that work with the New Zealand Ethics Committee and a number of ethicists around the world have, have expressed an interest in developing this, um, but where to start and how to begin and, um, you know, are actually really big questions and one that highlights the importance of needing to do something like this really well. Um, and that, you know, questions of sustainability, how would it be funded? The uh, NZEC model has really worked well because sort of two or three people have really carried it, and who, who might those people be? Um, so I think that there are, there, are, there are a lot of considerations to think through, and that's why I've asked to come and speak. Um, and what I just want to conclude with is just the notion of possibility, in that um, uh, one community-based group that did some research with, wanted to do research with asylum seekers um, uh, came to us. and. Uh, and basically through, through, through the research where we helped them to, to actually design the research, um, they've actually now put on the government's agenda around some, some real sort of discrepancies around um, human rights and the policies that the New Zealand government has towards asylum seekers and how that's very distinguished from refugees and um, people who come as UNHCR refugees to New Zealand. So, and really, within that report that they had, they put it at the very forefront that it had ethics review, and the government has responded to that, and they said that with previous reports, that that hasn't always been the case, and so it has provided some of that legitimacy to, uh, to that voice. So this is just what they said, that, you know, that, um, that they honored and valued our research participants. Uh, we feel stronger about what we're doing as a way of valuing our participants. So really, um, I would just like to hear from you around your thoughts around, would this work? Are there actually huge... <laughs> Um, warnings that you want to signal, um, or other considerations that, that might be worth um, taking into account. Thank you. Thank you, Jake, for your uh, presentation. Uh, you, uh, uh, anybody has some questions? Yes? Um, thank you very much, Jay, for your presentation. I think it was very enlightening. Um, I also work in an ethics research committee for a non-governmental organization that is international. And when it started off, it started off more as a review process to increase the vigor of the research that was done by the branches of the organization in different countries. But what we found now is that more and more we've seen that there's a necessity to include a governance process and an accountability process. So I'm going to ask you, do you really think it's possible to bridge, to become the bridge you want to become with the New Zealand Ethics Committee without having a sort of accountability process? And if, is it possible to have governance procedures that don't necessarily um, 
become a block or a challenge for conducting important research, but also find ways of creating accountability mechanisms that are important, especially if you're going to be working on international disaster with international organizations yeah. and you're going to be dealing with all these other issues you're talking about. Yeah. I mean, I think that, that accountability process is, 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 a, is a really important one. Um, I mean, I even think about the article in, the, in, in Public Health Research by uh, Colleen that, sh that showed, I think, that uh, the only a minority of, of, app, of, of papers relating to Ebola and the Marburg virus, I think over the last 10 years, something like that, actually stated that they had ethics review. So, um, I mean, one thing is that, uh, is one thing is that if, if, if there isn't this in place, and one way that, um, that this research and evaluation is going to happen anyways, it's actually happening right now. Um, but I think that uh, regardless, there, there still needs to be some sort of process around the accountability of that. We've asked applicants to report back to us on sort of how things have gone. Um, and uh, so far, that, that's actually been smooth sailing. But um, again, because we don't have any power, effectively powerless, we don't have an institutional backing that people don't have to go through us, that there's nothing that we can do to force them to report back to us. So it could actually be that bad practices are happening and that that there's very little accountability around that. Um, so I'm not really sure how, how to get around that or if, if you've got any suggestions. Um, and you know, I'm also aware that there are other organizations like MSF that have got um, ethics review processes. But again, from what I understand, you have to be, you have to be co-opted within MSF or be under that umbrella to have that review. And so we're trying to think about this more broadly. But I think it's really important to also state that, that just because you want to do research doesn't mean that, that is, that's your right. And that again, you know, it's about sort of ensuring um, when people apply that they've actually really seriously thought about and deeply thought about the research that they're wanting to conduct. Um, thanks, Jay, for this interesting presentation. I'm Emmanuel from the University of Copenhagen. Um, this was a, a quick question. It's regarding, um, I've always got this question whenever I've been on the field, um, is especially when doing community-based research is, uh, especially let's say after the tsunami or mega disasters where there's so much of disaster tourism, if I can call that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because there's, uh, there's not, I mean, the minute you see a media attention towards major events, there's a big rush towards, let it be the tsunami, let it be Haiti, let it be any of those, Japan, for example. Um, communities always continue to kind of question us, we are tired in some way of researchers because you, go back narrating the story over and over again. Um, does ethics, let's say for example, when applications come to you, um, is there, do you kind of emphasize or suggest that these results go back to the community? Are they communicated in any way back? Not just to you, right? Um, is there any, do you know that, is there a way of how that, that's done or? In terms, of the, in terms of the New Zealand Ethics Committee model? Uh, yeah. Um, we, we, we do have a question in the form which asks them around sort of the plans for dissemination and their anticipated impacts. Um, I mean, I think one of the things around disaster tourism, I mean, the you know, people, the helicopter, the parachute sort of metaphors that oftentimes happen, is that a lot of times that, that disaster tourism is actually the academics themselves that have access to ethics review or within those institutions. And so really most of our work would be looking at trying to support local groups that don't necessarily have that access, so hopefully they, they, there wouldn't be as much of that disaster tourism, but I mean certainly there'd be other organizations that, international organizations that respond to that that, that, that would. Um, but again, the, the accountability mechanisms around that, around the reporting of that in terms of how well it's gone and, and the impacts of it, um, again if it's a voluntary process, there are limited avenues to sort of force someone to, to report back on that. No more questions. So, Jay, thanks very much for your presentation again. Yeah.